everyone. Uh, back to our podcast here. And today we have Connor Shorten with me, um, who will talk a bit about his research, about vector databases, about YouTube, hopefully as well. So I'm expecting a really nice discussion today. Hey, Connor, how are you doing? Hey, Dimitri, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Really excited to you know, continue our episode and maybe dive more into the re deep learning research side. I think our first podcast on Henry AI Labs went really into the detail and the practical implementation and the history of BERT and Elasticsearch and then all the different vector databases. And I think so now we can kind of maybe look more in the researchy side of things and sort of discuss together about where we think all this vector search engine stuff is headed. Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's exciting to uh, to be recording this on the day when you actually released that video. So obviously we will link <laughs> it so uh, for our listeners yeah. and our audiences. And hey, uh, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, great. So, I, so to say, to introduce myself, I guess I would like to kind of like be reintroducing myself almost every like year or so as obviously I make these YouTube videos and I'm kind of like still discovering my role in deep learning research and still learning myself. So in my journey, I'm in my uh, second year of my PhD. I finished my master's degree where I got started with research on generative adversarial networks and data augmentation. I've published literature reviews on data augmentation for images and text. And this has really been my research focus is data augmentation. The idea, primarily my interest was, um, I started out with, when I first learned about deep learning, right away, I come from uh, being a basketball player. I played basketball in college and I was, you know, ready to go deep learning for basketball. How can this improve basketball? So I, um, so one thing about basketball is when you're playing, you want to have a highlight mixtape where, you know, you have all your best moves and helps you get the college scholarship. And so I was really familiar with that process of what it takes to be recruited to play college basketball. So I wanted to build this computer vision system that would crop out, uh, you know, your, your made baskets from full game tapes automatically. And so I came into this problem that everyone has seen where if you try to do supervised learning with small data sets, it, it does not work. And so like, yeah. and annotating data is extremely difficult. Like you can, if you are doing it yourself, you could probably get yourself like, um, you know, in my case, I was annotating made baskets in video clips, which is already high dimensional data already, uh, you know, paying to store all that data. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and labeling it was a problem. So I said, maybe data augmentation, because I'm overfitting this data. So I can try to rotate it, crop it, horizontally flip it, increase the brightness, this whole package of things you can do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Augmentation, yeah. Right, and, and so it worked pretty well. So I was um, pretty inspired by this idea of data augmentation. I really like papers like Francois Chalet's on the measure of uh, intelligence where discussing the ideas of like uh, system-centric uh, generalization, developer-aware generalization, known unknowns, this kind of you know matrix of known and unknowns with generalization yeah. cases. So I hold the belief that we can kind of steer the data in the direction that enables more generalization and that the key to unlocking more generalization is mostly going to be in the data space. So I'd say I'm in this data centric AI category, which has you know, lately become one of the buzzwords of <laughs> where your camp is. I love things like neural architecture search and different learning strategies and all that, but I really love the data augmentation. I think there's so much opportunity and research to explore this further and then and so, yeah, so I have a few ideas of how this could intersect with vector search engines and vector representation learning. So that's on one end. So that's kind of, you know, my research interest is in data augmentation and a bit of a background about how I became so inspired in data augmentation. So then to say kind of what I'm doing uh, right now is, you know, I've, so I've started doing some experiment papers. Most of my computing is managed with Google Collab which is pretty nice, you know, like um, you have the Google Collab notebooks and then you have the Google Drive integration for persistence and, you know, you can make it pretty far with that without putting a dent in your wallet by you know, doing it, by getting too carried away. And uh, so, so that's kind of how I'm setting that up. And, um, you know, I have, you know, I can tell people about, like, as I mentioned in the beginning, trying to reintroduce myself and figure out my role. So I had kind of like recently like a high of achieving the best student paper at this ICT AI conference on something about inductive biases. Wow. And then the next day I get my ICLR reviews back, which were, not great. So, you know, and that's kind of the journey of this, you know, yeah. I'm just setting, setting forward to ICML and trying to just bounce back and stay on this journey of figuring yeah. out how to do deep learning research. So it's yeah, that's definitely fantastic. a high. 
isn't it isn't yeah. like almost always like that you know like in machine learning nothing is predictable and nothing is given you know like and you need to be kind of averse to that or not averse but resistant right like okay i'm fine i can take risks but it's like a, a marathon it's not a sprint yeah, oh yeah definitely I, and just the disappointment of investing a month or two into a research project and then you just start running the experiments and you're like oh this is not working and your advisor is on the phone twice a week and saying how's it going and you're like not good <laughs> you know like, so that's stressful and you know anyone else going through that i can definitely relate to that kind of struggle and is, is this by the way why you do uh, your youtube show henry ai labs is this why you do it or is there something else as well i just wanted to kind of tap into the psychological element of it if you thought about it yeah, yeah, I'd love to talk about, I mean, my inspiration for YouTube came from, I guess I was just like one of these people who really enjoyed like, we would have guest lectures come to Florida Atlantic University. Uh, one that stood out to me more than anything else is researchers from Johns Hopkins came to, um, they had built a prosthetic limb that connects to a brain computer interface. And they have people who have lost their limbs and they can, you know, blindfolded touch an orange and say, this is an orange, this is an apple, this is a banana. And they came to talk to us at Florida Atlantic. And I mean, it was it was inspiring. I, like, I love these kind of seminars and just, and I guess, like falling in love with this kind of presentation. It's almost like, say, like, to me, it's kind of like analogous to like maybe like stand up comedy, how you have someone who gets up on stage and puts the show on, you know, with the benefit yeah. of the slides behind them. And, you know, I really like these these kind of talks. And that's kind of so that's kind of like the art of it is what I really like about YouTube. I mean. I definitely believe in YouTube as the medium for communicating these ideas right now. I, you know, like, um, we, and we'll get into talking about writing on medium and like, mm -hmm. yeah, like the different ways you can write on Twitter, you can write on medium, you can uh, record podcasts and put it on Spotify, Apple, and you can write these research papers, obviously just, you know, upload it to archive, treat it like a medium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess the, the number of, the number of views on archive is probably less than what you get on YouTube, but <laughs> the content is different too. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I really believe in the medium and then I just want to see the art form develop further. Like I'm really impressed with what Yannick Kilcher is doing. Like right now he's just released auto regressive diffusion models and, you know, I'm excited to watch it. And that's, and that's the fun about it is, yep. is you have this excitement about it. Let's link that as well. It's a, it's a YouTube as well, or uh, like a, another yeah. show you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. I think just um, YouTube Yannick Kilcher. I think most of our viewers will <laughs> know what we're awesome. talking about. Awesome. I just want to make sure that I will also educate myself. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's link that. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, and so, yeah, you said that data augmentation is one thing you worked on and, and I guess continue working on. It's actually interesting that you you did that in CV space, uh, but there is also somehow connection in text, right? Or can you tell a bit more about that? Yeah, so I so I spent the uh, I think it was this. Sorry, if I'm I'm getting my dates wrong. It's currently the fall, so I think I spent the summer spring of last year trying to transition these ideas into text. So I I did the image data augmentation survey in 2019, where the sentiment was still extremely hot around GANs, generative adversarial networks. Everyone was really excited about this real fake loss. We can generate data and then add that to the data set, and then you know suddenly we have this very broad coverage for interpolation in our uh, data space. So then I was trying to look into text. Uh, text is, I'd say the key lesson I learned is that it's harder to be label preserving. When you're forming the X prime Y, it's less likely that the Y is gonna have that same high level class labels as you're trying to do things like say, the, like the, the starter kit would be random swapping, random insertion, random deletion, those kind of things. And then you kind of transition into maybe trying to use a knowledge graph to better guide the text you're replacing. And then ideas like say mix up where you cut and paste and glue sentences together. <laughs> I'm not like a huge fan of that, but it's kind of interesting. Yes. Reminds me more of like dropout. It's kind of like a, you know, like I, I don't think there's a lot of intuition in the data space of why just smashing them together <laughs> would work so well, <laughs> but it, it does kind of work. And then, uh, and then I really like this category of generative data augmentation is obviously mentioning my start in generative adversarial networks and this idea that you learn the data distribution. So you sample from the data distribution to learn classifiers and kind of classifiers being almost like a appendage of the generative model, which is, which is like what we're talking about with the modules, the supervised learning tasks that you append onto the vector search engine database. It's like this task of having a generative model or say a 
uh, representative vector space is kind of like the, the real context that builds into these supervised learning tasks, or at least that's the way I see it. And, you know, maybe anyone can leave a comment if they are have a different idea about that or think it's ill aimed. But so that's kind of how I see those two things integrating. So to connect this back to text, what we can do is text is we can use things like GPT-3 or more so what they do is you would prompt GPT-3. So you'd say, um, you know, please finish this movie review with a positive sentiment as the prompt. And then you can just remove whatever you want from the original data point and GPT-3 can generate a new movie review. And then you can blow up your data set size, avoid the pitfalls of overfitting and that kind of promise of data augmentation. So hopefully that kind of answers the question of how I did this transition from image to text data augmentation. Yeah, it does. And I mean, why I'm asking also is because, um, you know, you can also treat these two sources of data uh, in like kind of in a uh, joint training task, right? So you can kind of train the joint neural network. And for example, when you watch, let's say, watch uh, using the algorithm, you watch the movie uh, or cartoon and you see some scene where, you know, one, one um, hero is kind of crying, the other one is cheering him up, you know. Now, where do you pay attention to? It's also important, right? Because it's the whole scene. Now, you need to pay attention maybe just to that pin on his neck, you know, that he's not happy about and, um, you know, things like that. So have you thought about that as well? Or are you still considering them as independent uh, yeah, no, yeah, I love that idea. The, like, I think what we're, the word that most people are using is uh, multimodal uh, learning. We, and I'd call that paper multimodal data augmentation. And, you know, just last night, Microsoft released a new 2.5 billion parameter image text embedding space. You know, everyone knows about OpenAI's clip uh, image text spaces and the dolly, the avocado shaped armchair generation. <laughs> everyone likes that. So, yeah, I mean, Multimodal learning is so exciting. I, I, yeah, I, I'd say um, it's it's going to be an interesting thing with the computation of it and what kind of and what the computation requires for setting up these kind of tests. I'd say, especially with video data, like you just mentioned, I you know I wouldn't really want to play around with video data with my collab Google Drive workflow <laughs> that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But but it's interesting also that big players like you mentioned Microsoft and I mean others they are moving in the direction of increasing the number of parameters in the model. But when you go to practice and you need to build a classifier, you know you don't have that much capacity. Like you don't want to spend that much capacity really, unless you are building like um, Terminator level AI which will handle all tasks. <laughs> That you have but probably you won't do that because it's still not there so do you also think about that kind of the practical element or are you still kind of fancying the the, the beauty of these complex models what way where, where do you see that yeah well i'll stake my flag in the same camp as the foundation models researchers and uh you know i think it was mostly stanford they published this paper titled on the opportunities and risks of foundation models some title like that i'm sorry if it's not exactly correct but, you know, this kind of ideology that the big companies like Microsoft, NVIDIA, Google, Facebook, they'll build these big, big models. And then what we'll do is we'll use this knowledge distillation interface to compress it into practical use cases. And so we've seen, I'd say this started with uh, Colin Raffle and, and the people who worked on that paper uh, with the text to text transfer transformer, the T5 model. And that showed how you could unify all text supervised learning tasks through the same kind of language modeling style, style interface. You just prompt it with, uh, you know, natural language inference, and then you give it the input, or you say, answer this question, give it the input, or you say, re-rank these documents, then give them the do documents. So it's the same interface for every supervised learning task. So yeah, I, I'm a, and then um, just one more thing to kind of put in the citation context is um, this general purpose, like OpenAI clip, and uh, I, it looks like Microsoft, I think they're calling it Bletchley or something like that. But um, this idea of just having two vector embedding spaces, and then using the contrastive alignment as the general interface for any kind of task, because as we mentioned, you can put any task into natural language. Any task that you're going to do with supervised learning could be described with natural language. So you have that kind of interface and the Allen Institute has another architecture called general purpose vision systems that, you know, unifies all these tasks, it, object detection, semantic segmentation, surface normal estimation, all these kind of ideas are unified in one architecture interface. So to kind of wrap up my answer to the question, I, I think it's going to be Microsoft and them scaling up like crazy. Maybe they're going to run it out of internet scale data eventually. I think Microsoft has said that they can train like a 32 trillion parameter model if they were motivated to do so. So I think they're going to run out of internet scale data and then the data augmentation 
will be the next step from going from say like the 400 million image text pairs that are now open sourced or uh, Luther AI has the pile, which is like 800 gigabytes of raw text if you want to if you want to do something with that. So I think eventually as you go into the 32 trillion parameter and, and on, they're gonna use data augmentation to have these inductive biases about how we can uh, keep scaling the data side of it. So uh, yeah, so I, I yeah. think they can scale the models for a while. <laughs> yeah, I guess they probably, they are doing an amazing job, but like they are probably still riding the horse of what Peter Norvig called the unreasonable effectiveness of data, right? So like your algorithm might not be <laughs> kind of as as uh, nuanced as, as your data is. And so just give it to the machine learning algorithm as much as possible and then kind of it will learn, right? But you mm -hmm. know, like in practical situations, this is what I alluded to, like you just don't have that much data. On the other hand, you don't want, you don't have that much choice. And you also mentioned this, this is very interesting topic of data augmentation in text because in images you can do like cropping rotation and hue changes mm -hmm. and whatnot. In text, you can't do that like so easily. Uh, for example, if you say you have a sentence, London is the capital of Great Britain, you cannot put Barcelona there. <laughs> it will <laughs> not make sense. So, uh, you know, but like you can still find another example where you could probably swap cities and that's how you build, you know, the augmentation. But then there are other things. For example, if you take machine translation, you know, uh, it suffers from hallucination problem. I don't know if, if you heard about it, but like if you have certain like uh, distortion in your data, for example, you crawled the websites and you also crawled uh, erroneously the advertisement. So you glued the advertisement to the source pair, uh, source uh, target pair, right? Uh, now your model is hallucinating about that advertisement when it shouldn't have, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's flipping facts. It's also switching, mm -hmm. you know, object and subject easily. So it's not something, and again, now I'm stepping on the territory of the model itself, right? But like, and model robustness, but I think data augmentation plays a key role in actually making sure that your model can kind of at least not hiccup on some very basic things, right? So. Yeah, and we're completely in agreement with that. I think um, one other part to that story will be how, uh, say, so Facebook has this model called retrieval augmented generation, where the whole idea is to add more context to avoid this hallucination problem. So to kind of break down three things you just said, I want to start off with the, yeah, the hallucination thing and transitioning right into that. So, so yeah, I think the idea of adding more context is our best solution to stopping uh, hallucination and maybe using consistency contrast of loss, loss functions for the fine tuning to, to make sure they're attending on the context. Because like I recently reviewed a paper on my channel titled Open, Do uh, uh, open Challenges in Open Domain Generalization, subtitle like that, where, um, where yeah, these models, you get them the context so they have additional context in the input, but they just don't read it. <laughs> and they just generalize as if it's not there. So fixing that problem is definitely step one. And so then to go into the second thing that you mentioned where you replaced London with Barcelona. And, and that's the thing about text data augmentation is it's, it's not label preserving really. It's harder to find symmetries in the space. It's easier to find these differences. So there's one paper maybe I'd like to point readers to titled uh, negative data augmentation. And so they're kind of flipping the, so it's like, how do we use augmented data? Should we just keep using this, you know, KL divergence between the uh, one hot class vectors, or should we do something different with the augmented data? We mentioned consistency losses where the loss would be, you know, the representations of X and X prime, ignoring whatever the Y label is. And negative data augmentation is saying, you know, push them apart. They, these are not the same mm -hmm. label. Mm -hmm. We've switched London with Barcelona. And so then I think the last thing, as we're talking about, uh, like the practical implementation, I think you say two things, there's like two directions of that, which are really interesting. And I think what you're getting to with the data augmentation is, is you want to prevent overfitting. If you have, if you're, you know, grabbing Microsoft's 32 trillion parameter model, and you've only got a hundred, you know, labeled examples, there's no way that's going to work. So you want to prevent overfitting. And then I think kind of the second part to that story, when people talk about this kind of topic is, uh, is like storage and inference costs and, and obviously training costs, if you're going to fine tune this. So maybe training costs has been solved with prompting where you don't actually need to do any gradient descent updates. You just give more in the input context. But then I think inference cost is solved at this knowledge installation interface. And, uh, and I think hugging face, uh, man, I think the name of their product is, uh, lightning or something like that where it's about inference acceleration and it looks like they're you know they're doing it pretty well so i would certainly bet on hugging face to solve that problem oh yeah absolutely i think they call it infinity no infinity 
yeah yes yeah. sorry about that no <laughs> it's okay <laughs> it's also like testing your memory you know like yeah, yeah. we remember and i think it's still also like at some point and i think elon musk is afraid of it hey elon if you're listening to this hello uh <laughs> you know like um he's afraid of that our interface is way too slow right and so eventually yeah. ai will basically supersede us which i don't think so but let's see <laughs> so but also like what's interesting i was thinking that maybe a little bit like developing this topic further but it sounds you have so much knowledge on this and it's so so packed uh, uh what you said you know like for example if we could use the language model itself to help us generate you said gpt right it's generative model mm -hmm. but there could be some others which will kind of help us to generate things um and then augment the data set but there is one pitfall that i don't know if you've read this paper it's called what bird is not lessons from a new suite of psycholinguistic diagnostics for language models and so basically the paper essentially claims that bird does not um distinguish the negations and uh, that can be super super sensitive like in sentiment analysis right at least but also like in machine translation and other downstream tasks so have you thought about this like basically there is actually a now a development uh i think it's also on microsoft side to try to uh, bring knowledge into the language model and you can do it in a variety of ways you mentioned knowledge graph but there are other ways kind of to bring in the structured knowledge so any any thoughts on that on that topic yeah, and this is you know where I'm going to start getting back into Weviate because I think Weviate is going to be a huge part of solving that problem and adding the additional context. But first, I want to raise you one paper. So from the psycholinguistic thing, I, I want to point readers in the direction of viewers in the direction of a checklist. It, it was one of the best paper awards at a recent ACL conference. ACL is I think ACL EM NLP like the top NLP conferences. A checklist is. Is, yeah, exactly what you say. It's a it's a complete suite of tests for negations, named entity swapping, it, and it's really nice to use. It's on GitHub. So so yeah. So so they have the interfaces for testing for that kind of thing, which I think once you have the test, you can start hacking away at solving it, even if it's not theoretically grounded. If you have the right test, you could hack away until you've passed the test. So so checklist <laughs> is is the test for that. But then um, so yeah. So then the idea of context and. Um, and Weviate, so <laughs> yeah. So um, so Weviate is so the vector search engine part, and uh, you know, Facebook paper dense passage retrieval is their current approach, where they have you know the text embeddings of the documents, and they're going to go retrieve the context so that you can avoid hallucination, hopefully avoid these kind of vulnerabilities to robustness. But um, so vector search engines is what I see as being a huge player in solving that particular problem, and I see that transitioning not just from text, but image text, video text, like. The idea that you want to add some more context from your database to the current inference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, BAV8 is doing fantastic work. Um, actually, we have a podcast uh, recorded with Bob. And so, you know, my listeners can actually watch it. And then we also had a, an episode with you where we covered some of the things. And you also recorded a bunch of videos like walking through the feature set. Uh, what caught your attention in Viavid when um, kind of you, if you can slightly compare to other database uh, vendors? Okay, well, I, I don't have much of a comparison to other database vendors. And so I'm, you know, apologies to everyone out, out there working on this. It's my, my experience with it doesn't come from the practical software engineering side of it. It comes from reading these research papers and then being familiar with these ideas and then um, I mean, we V8 is easy to use. It's like, you know, it's really well, the documentation is great. It's easy to get started with it. So that was a huge thing for me is, um, you know, when I first met Bob, first of all, he, you know, he's a great guy and, you know, meeting the, this team, they're all really on top of everything. And their Slack chat is really great. People, you know, pitching in their problems and it, it's just a great community. But, you know, what, what did it for me is, uh, so I met Bob and then I spent about two weeks going through the documentation, the quick start, the installation, set up, you know, get my data sets in there. And it was just really easy to use. So I, and then, uh, and then learning about all these other things like the Python client, like as we talk about uh, fetching the context, you may want to integrate that into a training loop where say um, Facebook also recently released internet augmented generation, where they're using the Bing API to bring in the context and, and then learn with that extra training. So they have a Python client that lets you integrate that into your model workflows. And then uh, something we talked about in our last podcast, I love the GraphQL interface. I think it's really cool. And I love the um, the web demo. So you can, 
you know, get started with the GraphQL interface and you can practice your queries. So you can, um, you know, learn it quickly yeah. before you make any commitment of installing your massive database. So I, so yeah. yeah and, and I just think we is like a beautiful technology that's making yeah. my, my life is trying to do deep learning research just a lot easier. So, you know, it's awesome that they're willing to support Henry AI labs and help me continue making content on YouTube. Well, at the same time, it's a, you know, it's a tool that helps me do what I want to do with this kind of research. Yeah. And are you like already using the IV8 in your research or planning to use? Yeah. So, um, so I haven't really made a Henry AI Labs video on this yet, but it's something I'm really excited about. Um, so one paper I recently had accepted in ICML A, not, I, not quite ICML, but ICML A, it's applications added to it, but it's, um, it's uh, Keros Burt is the title of the paper and it's about you know, language modeling with Keras documentation and Keras code examples. And, you know, like Sayak Paul, Francois Chalet, they're going crazy with these Keras code examples. And there's so many examples. It's like you could, you have like a PhD and more organized completely online on this Keras code examples. To me, it's like the most interesting collection of deep learning information on the internet is the Keras code examples. So from there, there's like two ideas is like, can we build a language model that can like debug your Keras code for you? And, you know, OpenAI Codex, everyone knows that it looks like the answer to that is yes. And, and you know, they have the leak code, they have data sets of like leak code. <laughs> you know, I know everyone loves leak code. And then, <laughs> everyone and then, is looking for a job. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, Codex is, you know, able to pass these lead code tests. So, you know, and I, you know, I'd say some lead code tests are harder than the deep learning debugging. So, you know, it looks yeah. like, it looks like a pretty promising solution. And then, um, so then the second project I have that I'm integrating Weaviate with to help me do is, um, is you know, Facebook is big on unsupervised machine translation. They did a, they did a paper where they're translating between Python and JavaScript without any annotation. So maybe we can translate between uh, Keras and PyTorch without needing to, uh, or PyTorch and Jax even too, without, you know, somehow without much labeling. And this is very much an infant research project, but if you have that, if you could bring the Keras code examples to PyTorch and Jax and just, you know, help people yeah. share this knowledge. So, so those are like two of my personal projects that I've started integrating Weaviate in. And then um, one other project that I'm, you know, extremely passionate about and really into with my involvement with the university. And this is kind of a separate thing that I'm not uh, too heavy on because I don't want to like kind of push the commercial interest too much. It's, you know, and Weaviate is open source. So it's an open source software. We have, we can download it from GitHub and we yeah. have it. So they can't, you know, yeah. take it away. And so, so this other project is um, we're trying to build patient information retrieval systems where you, you know, you come to the hospital and they start to record your, um, you know, coagulation studies, they, all the physiological markers and the genetic history. And we want to go query the literature maybe. So this is, you know, as a research project, but and um, the Allen Institute has been pioneering this with data sets like Core 19 and their system called uh, SUP.AI. Salesforce Research had a system called CoSearch. I'm just kind of naming things for people to <laughs> look up. I'm not going to describe each of these things. But um, so th these are like literature, scientific literature mining systems where you, you know you want information about, say, COVID-19 and or, you know, someone's coming there with some obscure disease. You want to be able to query the literature with particular information about this patient. And so this is the information retrieval problem that you know we're super interested in as mm -hmm. vector search engine people. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to turn these patients into, which is um, what I have is mostly tabular data. You might get a little bit of medical images, some clinical reports for some text, but yeah, mostly tabular data. So we want to encode that into vectors, send those vectors into the scientific literature and then maybe there's some clinical trial, you know, cause it's so, it's so much data. Once you really download, like say the core 19 data set from the Allen Institute, you'll realize that, you know, 500,000 papers about COVID is nothing anyone could read. I, you know, I already, yeah. already know this from reading deep learning papers. It's like, no one yes. can read this. And even like, you know, like <laughs> if you go traditional way and I wanted also to tap in, into this area, you know, like if you go the traditional way, let's say you have a keyword lookup, right? So keyword search, mm -hmm. you would have to build like some kind of synonym layer, which means you need to understand what you're doing or you will need to hire somebody to do that. And that's like an additional step, which can kind of like, um, you know, doesn't reduce the journey for you. You have to do that and this <laughs> and that. You feel like you have more control maybe, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's very laborious. So at the same time, similarity search kind of doesn't have that boundary, right? So essentially you have encoded it and now you, 
you know, now the, the, the challenge, the complexity moves more into the space of choosing the right neural network and then choosing the right database. Everyone knows which is the right database. <laughs> so, but anyway, <laughs> but I'm just yeah. saying, like, but, but, but yeah. I'm just saying, like, um, do you think that similarity search will completely supersede um, keyword or you still see some synergy between them? Yeah, and well, I'd like before I get into saying my opinion on this, I'd say that I'm not the expert on keyword search. So, so here's my opinion on it. I, you know, WeV8 has a symbolic filtering where you can still do symbolic searches. You can still do the keyword filtering. You can still have these uh, symbolic characteristics. And, you know, I'm in the same, I believe things like what Gary Marcus talks about, about, you know, it's not really robust to these symbolic queries. What we mentioned earlier, where you insert negation and it might completely throw it off. So robustness is like not completely solve that. I was reading a paper this morning called from DeepMind researchers, data augmentation can help robustness. It was like such a on the nose title like that, like data augmentation helps robustness. So, so yeah, solving robustness. And I'm, you know, I still have a, I'm not like, I still think solving robustness is a huge issue for this. It's not completely <laughs> put together yet. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. So, but like, yeah, you mentioned you're not an expert on keyword search, but at the same time, I think you are the expert of using like Google, right? So like you still <laughs> type keywords and, yeah. and and I think psychologically you still expect, you know, the snippets to contain some of your keywords as a validation that the search engine got it, right? Mm -hmm. So like, otherwise search engine maybe that just, you know, returns you garbage in return to what you want. So. Yeah, and that, that's why I think like um, like the page rank uh, transition dynamic matrices, those those kind of things. That's like it won't be enough to just have the vector search engine. Probably you'll probably need some kind of like tuning layer, and that's why. So we V8 has the Python client. As I mentioned previously, a research project for this would be to integrate that Python client into the training loop of the you know, whatever's doing the supervised learning task. So it kind of isn't just retrieving. It's like we, when we talked about the difference in information retrieval and approximate nearest neighbor search, how there's kind of like the semantics differences between the things you're encoding, where you might be encoding a, a, like the email title and then the email body. And, you, and you, so you have these different kind of like transitions between the categories of objects you're encoding. So, so yeah, like the, um, you know, I still think that there's like a layer of, I don't know how to describe it. Maybe like that system one, system two. I know people like that analogy, but there's some kind of layer between keyword search and um, vector neural representations. There's something in the middle of that. And, you know, I don't know what it is, but yeah, I guess yeah. page rank. Yeah. Yeah. Like basically you're talking about sort of even, even after um, vector database has returned you the nearest neighbors, you still have a sort of liberty to apply a re-ranker right? Mm -hmm. Because, and that's where your business logic kicks in, like the rules, the product, the vision, the design, there are so many inputs into that process of, of ranking. And then ranking obviously is like a huge research area as well, you know, with uh, click biasing and things like that, right? Um, yeah, I mean, and it's also interesting, I just uh, it crossed my mind that yesterday, Richard Socher announced his search engine and um, u.com. And uh, mm -hmm. did, did you have a chance to check it out? Uh, basically for our listeners who didn't check it out yet. So it, it's a search engine which summarizes the web pages and the kind of documents and so on. And so you are kind of, it, it makes it actionable. So just one example, they can find you a code snippet on Stack Overflow that you can actually copy paste. And that's just one mm -hmm. example, right? But there are plenty of more. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I, I mean, first of all, Richard Sacher, his research has been incredible. And as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I, and I was listening to Systems Co-Search from Salesforce Research was, um, yeah, he was one of the authors, and I don't know who led the project. but um, So yeah, the u.com, I mean, it, it looks crazy. I, like, um, have I used it quite? Not really yet, but I definitely believe in the concept. And, uh, and yeah, the research is pointing in that direction. It, it's exciting. I, but yeah. Um, but do I think like solely neural system? Yeah, I mean, designing new inter interfaces around search. Sorry to go around that a little bit as I'm trying to like think while I talk. But yeah, that u.com thing, it's exciting. New spaces for search engines. It's like, it's hard, it's hard to even completely conceptualize it, I think, because it's such a, you think of Google as like this giant, undestructible search yeah. engine, but yeah, that's yeah. really not the story. There really is a ton of research in search engines. 
Yeah, yeah, but uh, actually, I'm uh, currently working for a web scale search engine, which I cannot mention because it's a, my it's my client on the NDA. But you know, we we basically have all the charts, and we know that Google is like ninety seven percent, and then everyone else is close to the bottom. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, well, of course, Bing has a couple percent of the market, and uh, and then it kind of if you go inside a specific country, the split might be different. Like if you take Russia, for example, Yandex is on top, and then Google is following them, but very closely. You know, um, but but overall, globally, Google is just somewhere beyond the sky. So you need to kind of differentiate a lot. You know, like you don't mm-hmm. want to build another Google. It's almost like Peter Thiel's book, you know, Zero to One, where mm-hmm. he says if you are building another Facebook, you're not learning anything from Mark Zuckerberg, or if you're building another Google, you're not you're not learning anything from the Google founders. Like you need to build that one. Right, and I think Richard is trying to build that one probably. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting direction that he's trying to involve AI much deeper in the process, uh, probably already surfacing, you know, users. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't have anything to add other than just ex- shared excitement about what you.com will become. <laughs> it certainly is exciting. Yeah, absolutely. All the best, Richard. Um, yeah, and uh, you um, actually, I wanted to make a slight segue into you. You've shared like a ton of in, a ton of information today. Um, I wonder how do you keep up with so much stuff happening? Like, what are your preferred sources of information? Like, obviously, YouTube is one, but you know, there is also Medium. There is uh, publications themselves. Uh, how how do you structure your sort of consumption? you know, parts like the pacing and kind of where to pay, put your attention and so on. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, early days of my podcasting, I was uh, doing the machine learning street talk with Tim Scarf and Yana Kilcher. And Tim asked uh, Jonathan Frankel, the author of the lottery ticket hypothesis, the same question, like, what's your information diet? And I thought, it, and it's a really interesting question. So Mine is, uh, you know, like most people out there trying to be good at something, it's chaotic and it gets overwhelming and I get really stressed out sometimes. <laughs> but uh, So I don't know if this is the best advice to follow, but like, here's what I do. So I, um, you know, I'm very active on Twitter, like maybe to the point of detrimental to my health. Like I check Twitter like all the time. Like, so I'm always refreshing Twitter and seeing the new headlines. And so I when I see like an archive link, I'll try to like, if I like it, I I've, I've try to discipline myself to be like, don't just like it, like read the abstract, like get a couple sentences in because clearly, you know, the titles caught your attention. So, so Twitter is really where I get all my news. And then the art form of making these YouTube videos. I mean, yeah, like Yannick Kilcher and Tim Scarf that I mentioned, the machine learning street talk, these kind of, this kind of medium, uh, it's, I watched that. It's pretty good. I think I watched it on like accelerated speed. Also, um, Alexa, Miss Coffee Bean to kind of go on the list. You know, they're not the only ones doing it well. A lot of people are starting to make really great YouTube videos. And I love that kind of medium of showing these things. So on my, my work, my, like my workout, say I'm a basketball player and I've got to work on my deep learning skills is, um, it's mostly about reading these papers. My experiments, I'd say the coding part is not super challenging thanks to things like Keras code examples and like thanks to them, major thanks to them because that saves me so much headache in just getting running. So so yeah, I try to, uh, I try to read like five papers at a time. I try to switch, I, start, I try to set 20 minute timers, drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> and um, what else do I do? Yeah, I guess that's it. Really reading the really reading the papers. I mean, if you make paper summary videos and write blog posts, that's also a huge way to retain it. I try to talk to a lot of people also. Just, um, you know, I try to keep a lot of contact. Like I, I'm organized all this through Twitter. So like, um, you know, I might just send messages to say Sayak Paul from uh, who makes, I, I think he works at um, Carded and he makes, he's one of the leaders of Keras Code Examples. I'll send him ideas. I'll be like, you know, I saw this paper on Twitter. I think, you know, this reminds me of what you're doing. And, and yes, I guess overall, that's my information diet. I'm probably leaving some things out. I didn't really, you know, prepare something for this, but. No, it's okay. I mean, it's also, it's also great that you're speaking your mind, but, and things that really uh, stick, you know, you mentioned them, right. Uh, But where on that scale, you would put medium, you know, the blogging platform where it kind of thrives with uh, tutorials. And sometimes these tutorials, 
they're kind of okay, but you kind of like, okay, are they going deep enough? But then there are other things where they summarize papers in such a way that they actually try to explain it. It's almost like popularizing mm -hmm. science because you do want to breed that next, you know, generation as well. And maybe you will have some feedback to your ideas because don't you think when you publish a research paper, you know, for the most a part of the humanity it's dry text uh, for some it's just greek right they will not even understand it they will not they will never read it and so but they still might be curious like okay how you know robots make decisions or something like that you know so or like how does my car how does my car keep the lane keeps the lane and actually today i was right. driving i was driving to 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 work and i was like my car actually switched to the lane keeping mode and it was telling me that I should not, you know, steer to the left that much. So it was actually steering to the right. But the moment it noticed that I put my hands away from the steering wheel, it actually started alarming me and saying, hey, are you asleep or something, you know? <laughs> so it's it's also like kind of caring for you, right? In a way. Mm -hmm. So it's not trying to do so much more work uh, in that sense. Yeah, like in the idea of popular science, I mean... Um... You know, I'm recording my podcast behind a bookshelf, like it makes me look smarter. But I don't. I only really, <laughs> I only really read books like you know, like the book of. I mean, the book of why is a bad example. That's a really great book, like technical, and I really, really like that one. But most of these like popular science books, I, I I'd have to be like on an airplane or something like I or or in same with the category of medium articles that are popular science. Like, um, you know, I I read research papers only. It, not to like be dismissive of anything else, but that's just like the question of what particularly do I study? Yeah. And, um, and my approach is very people centric, like, um, you know, like when say Chelsea Finn uh, publishes a new paper on Twitter, I'll go read that because I kind of have been following her thinking like Jeff Kloon is another example with the AIGAs or uh, Francois Chalet, these kind of people like I or like uh, Michael Bronstein with the geometric deep learning is another great example. If I, was, I hate I hate doing these lists. I never like to do these lists because it's so endless. Like the the vocabulary <laughs> you need to kind of assess. Like yeah, yeah. like I've left off so many people, but you know I I like the people centric focus, and I try to get to know these people and mm -hmm, understand mm -hmm. like how they think yeah. of these things. It's like the same thing as you go to the conference, uh, sometimes you don't go to that specific topic. Maybe when you are a little bit more junior, you do. But later in your career, like academic or industrial, you actually go to listen to that person because they might not give you any novel idea, but they might give you so much experience that you daily, like really need, right? Yeah, for sure. And just following the timeline of their work, it helped like their their newest work will help you realize, oh, that's their thinking in the past work too. I kind of see what they how they're thinking about these things. And, it, and it's like, you know, everybody thinks so abstractly, they have this idea, this vision. And it can be it's hard to communicate the vision in a in writing or videos. So yeah, just like you said, I think just repeated exposure to yeah. the same person is yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like hopefully that's henry ai labs <laughs> yes absolutely for some people i'm pretty sure i saw some really great uh, comments underneath your videos you know some people were saying i like, can't wait for the next one uh, so you're definitely doing great uh job there so kudos to you for for doing that uh, for so long actually I, I don't know for how long you've been doing this but you have a ton of videos yeah, and I really appreciate I, you know, the people who keep commenting, I, you know, I, I recognize your profiles, and I do really, really appreciate it. So uh, it, it helps me keep making the videos and staying convinced of that medium of YouTube being being one of the ways to express these ideas, I'd say, like, even, even more so than writing papers that you submit to these conferences, sometimes I, you know, I, I think making a YouTube video can be a uh, powerful way to share ideas. I don't know if I want to completely put my flag on that idea because I, you know, these reviews, you do get some really good reviews. Like, as I mentioned previously at the beginning of the video, I, you know, I lately got smashed on my ICLR reviews. They were not good, but, uh, <laughs> but I got, I got really high quality feedback. So, yes, you know, so you're learning from me. it. You're learning right. from it, right? Yeah. Actually, right, right, one right. of my managers used to say feedback is gold. So even <laughs> if it feels painful, take it. Because yeah. because the, the problem is that sometimes, especially as you grow in your career, you know, at mm -hmm. some point you will be the role model for some other people. Now, where do you get the feedback? From nowhere. 
because you <laughs> you are the person giving feedback. But you still need to grow. You still have pains. You have doubts. You have ideas. You need validation. And maybe you are doing something wrong as well at some point. Maybe somebody is intimidated to tell you that because you are at the top. You are like the boss or whatever. You know, like who gives right, you right. who who gives you feedback? At that point, they they actually recommend to turn to um, you know professional coaches and kind of those people who can actually steer you in some direction, right? Or, or maybe you can unload your thoughts. Uh, have you found yourself in that situation or what, 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 what do you think? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I'm in a lucky situation where I do have a formal PhD advisor that, as I mentioned, I speak on the phone with very often. And, um, and, you know, my PhD advisor and I have had a relationship for so long that he like introduced machine learning to me. So it's like, <laughs> I was a basketball player you know, taking classes. And I, and so this was my introduction to machine learning. I, like, I hardly understood like, a, you know, like a T test statistical regression analysis before this class. So it's like, so I'm, I've had the same advisor for a long time in that regard, like a formal academic advisor. And then meeting people like Bob and, you know, you and I, as we talk now, I, you know, I'm trying to reach out and pick the brains of people and see what they think, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So basically they are like, they become like you might have multiple role models and sometimes you know like they also say you do not need a physical person with whom you talk but it could be some kind of online person like for me it used to be for a long time elon musk because i've been focusing on building startups and and his approach to startups was not like hey you know go unleash yourself get rid of your doubt and just do it no he's so yeah. deep into what he does like at some point i want to record a podcast where i would like to talk to you or talk to somebody to actually explain and kind of does it resonate with you like his thinking like first you need to try this before automating this you need to repeat it several times to learn your mistakes and blah blah, blah. so it's like an amazing way and he like build this kind of you know a thought machinery that he applies to any problem right so any mm -hmm. problem that lands in his hands he's like i can try it step by step like that and see what happens. And maybe at some point it just drops out and you're like, okay, I'm done here. I'm moving to the next one, right? So I'm not going to waste my time. And he's a super productive guy, as we know. And <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes it could be just an online person that you follow. And as you said, you you do this on Twitter, like you said, like maniacally <laughs> refreshing the Twitters. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> just just stay stay safe as well there. But at the same time, I think there is period of time in your life when you are learning a ton, and later in your life, you will be kind of generating fruit out of it, mostly. Or maybe you will you will be telling to other people and maybe inspiring them more and more, uh, and then leading some research groups and or you know teams, and and that's 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 totally fine. But I also wanted to call out your uh, idea that I think is quite instructive for many of us and hopefully to our listeners that, yes, do go, go and read papers because as Andrew Ang put it, he said, if you read a paper every weekend, let, let's say you have a full-time job, you don't have time to read it, um, you can read it on the weekend. At some point, uh, and, and he also recommended to start coding, you know, like actually you, you, you didn't find the code for it, just try to implement the idea, right? At some point after reading the papers, you will actually start generating ideas because you will find gaps in the thinking of the authors on all of these papers and nobody is doing perfect job there. They are doing the publishable work, right? And so I think that resonates with you as well. Yeah, definitely. For that, You definitely uh, like switch gears where you become an idea machine, like you say, where you read a paper and you'll have like a billion ideas for how to extend it. And then you'll transition to this, this part, which is what I'm learning now. And, you know, as I'm in my last year, I've, I'm two years into my PhD and the transition for me is going from idea machine to, okay, can you really build the idea for real? Like, do you, do you really know how to test this? And so, and that transition isn't super obvious and it's, it's painful to be going back and forth between, you know, theoretical idea machine. I'm reading these papers because like in terms of like that flow state of creativity that you get into when you're, when you're working on things for me personally, reading papers is like the most satisfying thing. I feel very like productive when I'm reading papers. I might, you know, I feel good, but when I'm mm -hmm. engineering things, I feel more pain than like, cause it's more yes. painful. I'd say. 
Yes, yes. And this is where, of course, you do want to have those oiled, well, well-oiled software systems that you don't need to waste your time setting things up or running out of disk or whatever, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it happens so, so, yeah. so frequently. Uh, so, like yeah. even the innocuous things, like before I had integrated Google Drive with Google Collab and it would crash and I'd be like, I've just lost 10 hours of running this thing. <laughs> so, yeah. And that is not good. Like, you, like, like well, this is, I think, what Joel Spolsky said at some point, you know, the co-founder of Stack Overflow, you know, he said, like, imagine that you want to print a, a piece of paper and you log into your computer and it says, please up upgrade the driver. So you upgrade the driver and then operating system says, I need to reboot. So it reboots and it, it basically wastes 10 minutes of your time. And then you, you and then again, it says, hey, actually uh, I cannot print because you ran out of something. Now again, you need to install some. And you like, instead of solving the problem, you, you become the administrator of your computer, <laughs> right? And that's the same, <laughs> the same thing can happen so much, uh, so often in, in, in software you know, development and research as well, because, because I think as somebody will put on Twitter, we do not actually choose between big and small, like do a lot of things and do like small amount of things. We usually choose between small and nothing. And so I guess when, when those things eating a lot of your small time, right to nothing, you're like frustrated and you're like, okay, I'm just down the rabbit hole. What am I doing? And so I think tools like the Aviate save a ton of time and everybody who is innovating in this space from the direction of usability, you know, like, and saving time, shaving those minutes off of, uh, you know, your experience, I think that will save so much time for your thinking as well. Yeah. And, yeah. And before uh, we did, I, I was doing a little bit of the sponsored content work and which for me is great because I get to talk to these people and, <laughs> and they, t they teach me a lot. And um, so this is with Determined AI, which is now a part of Hewlett Packard. And so, yeah, they're building the hyperparameter, like the distributed training hyperparameter optimization, which what we're talking about, like um, the administrator of the system, they're doing a lot of this work. And, you know, as anyone, I'm sure people listening to this have gotten smoked with the cost of one of these experiments too. <laughs> so it's not just your time, it's your wallet. Oh, yeah. and it's, <laughs> and it's not fun. <laughs> oh yeah, actually you reminded me of one uh, Google um, Cloud, um, was it, it's, it wasn't a tutorial, like a workshop, it was a free one. They even like gave us food. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> so you just show up. They 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 feed you, and then they tell you things, and and they it was a practical one. And I remember that one of the instructors. He was not an employee of Google, but he was certified. And and you know like he said, hey, now we're gonna spin the Spanner cluster, and Spanner is the MySQL planet scale with all the consistency and semantic guarantees using atomic clocks. And there is like a fantastic presentation uh, by one of its engineers that I have in my recordings. I have not published yet because I don't know if Google will try to sue me. But, you know, the idea is that it's a it's a fantastic system and there is a paper as well. And then the, the, the guy, the teacher, he said, well, hold on, don't spin too many of them because I get the bill. And last <laughs> month, I got a bill of $4,000 and Google could not reimburse it because they said, you're not an internal employee. So he was like, it's fun, but, you know, to the point when you might <laughs> yeah, regret like it. It's funny. It's funny now, but at the time, it's not funny at all. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that um, Determined AI calls it lunch and learn. They're this kind of concept for uh deep learning or like I'd say to science content, like um, even like, you know, with physics and they're going to be doing experiments where it's, ex it's expensive. So we, we're not going to each be doing it. We're going to watch one person do it and kind of gather around as a community. And yeah, I see that as being a huge part. Just like the Uber Eats coupons, I think is a brilliant interface for it. And then everyone attends the thing. But yeah, I love yeah. that kind of. And then just quickly. Um, so like one thing we're working on at Weviate and uh, as people have seen with Hugging Face data sets and the Kaggle competitions, well, Hugging Face data sets is a little different, but the be is um, hosting the demos cheaply. So that so um, in Weviate, uh, we're working on this, the wiki data is gonna be the next big release where we have the PyTorch big graph embeddings, which is the, the graph structure makes it different from say Wikipedia because it's really good at entity embeddings. As we mentioned, London and Barcelona, if you construct a knowledge graph, 
of Barcelona compared to London, that's going to have a better entity representation using learning techniques like deep walk or node to vec, or maybe, maybe yeah. like a graph convolutional network with an auto encoder loss, but probably deep walk or node to vec is what I would say is, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not completely caught up with that, but, yeah. but anyway, so, so having that kind of data set, the wiki data, and now it's cheaper. That's the mm -hmm. huge difference. That's the change in deep learning is hugging faces, hosting all these data sets, so you don't have to host them yourself. You can just quickly access them. And with WeV8, it's even more exciting, in my opinion, because they're hosting a vector search engine with yeah. model inference. I mean, Hugging Face is doing model inference too, as we talked about Infinity, where they've got the inference time down to like milliseconds for mm -hmm. these massive models. Is um, yeah, is is you don't have to pay for the hosting of these things, which is obviously yeah. good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and also not 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 like mess with hosting things because that that's also the cost of maintaining is the cost not to neglect. So absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, it was such a packed conversation. I think the show notes will be infinite because you mentioned so many names, so many articles, and that's fantastic. Thanks so much for doing this. I wanted to to still kind of end on kind of um, a little bit like that philosophical stance, which I usually do. And I think we touched a lot on that and thanks for doing this, but like in summary, what drives you, why are you doing this, what you are doing? Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> 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 that's quite a question. I mean, um, uh, I guess like, um, and I've heard, you know, as you mentioned, Elon Musk, I've heard that he says like, I want to be useful. That, that's one thing he says. Yeah. And I, I guess I'm in the same way trying to do the useful thing. <laughs> and, um, you know, I guess like, you know, I like, obviously I like these big grandiose visions of things like, you know, helping with healthcare and self-driving cars and helping with poverty and creating housing, climate science, all these kind of things, obviously. So, <laughs> yeah. so obviously there are these big grandiose goals that I think we all share truthfully. And, but then it's more of a question of how do you stay in the grind of it and how do you keep waking mm -hmm. up and mm -hmm. keep getting yeah. at it. And so I'd say that kind of heuristic of just try to do useful things every day is actually yeah. pretty good guidance. So like we all share these big visions, but we, you know, we need the motivation to pick ourselves off the couch and keep doing it every day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it also sounds like you mentioned you played basketball and you continue playing that, right? So that oh, yeah. thing, when <laughs> you do the sport, you need to be persistent, right? Mm -hmm. And your body right. sometimes doesn't want to do it maybe, but you know in your mind that you do want to do it. And so that persistency, I think, also translates into, you know, the, the research and keeping up with things, right? Yeah. Yeah. And to, to stay on that kind of analogy, I'd say like the, the physical pain of basketball is like, you might hurt your knee. You might have some tendonitis is that kind of physical pain or the physical pain of when you're doing conditioning and you can't breathe that you, you're going to have that same kind of analog with this kind of mental work and it'll manifest itself in like depression and burnout. And so you have to be like, as you do more training, you get better at the pain of the injuries, so to say, like, it's like injuries to your mind and the same kind of analog as physical uh, injuries would be. And I think understanding that and accepting it and <laughs> yeah. dealing with it is important as well. And then it kind of translates into maybe some other region of your brain when you have this space from like, you know, you know reviews or, you know, like your experiment <laughs> going haywire, you can oh, be yeah. like, oh yeah, <laughs> fine. I gotta get a cup of coffee and, you know, in five minutes, I'm okay, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, co <laughs> the coffee is the key supplement. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Connor, thanks so much. Uh, this was such a fantastic conversation. I'm pretty sure we can repeat it, um, have another one. And I can't wait to see what development you're doing with the Aviate and also in all your research projects. You know, stay active, stay hungry, stay foolish, as Steve Jobs used to say. Uh, and I think that's fantastic what you're doing. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me, Dimitri. Bye.